Hi, everyone. My name is Cliff Kirsch, and I'd like to welcome you to the Evershed Sutherland Webcast Advisors Act Regulatory Se Series First Quarter Update. I'm joined today by my colleagues Michael Koffler, John Walsh, Issa Hanna, Ben Marzouk, and Breer Adams here in the U.S., and our colleague Hannah Jones in London. This program is the latest in our quarterly series of complimentary webcasts dedicated to issues affecting investment advisors, and uh, thanks again for, uh, for joining. Before we begin, a few uh, Housekeeping notes. Uh, number one, if you'd like to receive CLE credit for this webcast, please download the CLE sign-in sheet and evaluation form from your viewing console and follow the instructions for submission. And also, if you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them via the Ask a Question text box on your viewing uh, console. And the last, if, uh, if you want to receive a copy of the uh, slide deck, please uh, let us know. Uh, any one of us would be happy to uh, make a copy available to you and send you a copy. So with that, uh, we have a lot to cover in the uh, next hour. Uh, we're going to focus on recent advisor regulatory de developments, examination, enforcement, and uh, related trends. And we thought we'd start off with a few minutes talking about the uh, uh, update season, the 2019 ADV update season, uh, as we approach uh, March 31st. The, uh, then we wanted to... Uh, talk about recent developments regarding the SEC share class selection disclosure initiative. Uh, then uh, a, uh, uh, a quick update on the OC risk alert on electronic communications. Uh, a, uh, an update then on the fiduciary duty initiatives, both uh, Regulation BI at the SEC and also some of the state initiatives. Uh, then some current uh, developments regarding custody and custodial practices. And then a, uh, an update on GDPR and related developments regarding SEC registration of Euro European-based advisors. And then we'll uh, end with some hot topics in the uh, uh, UK, and uh, most notably the FCA's Asset Management Market Study, and, and also a discussion, a uh, quick update on uh, Brexit. So a lot to cover. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to dive right into the first topic, uh, the, uh, the 2019 ADB update season. And again, uh, with, a, with a view to just mentioning a couple of items as we approach uh, March 31st. So, the, you know, the first thing we wanted to, uh, to know are a couple of last-minute checks that, that, that we just wanted to call to your attention. <clears throat> and we just wanted to call uh, a couple of the items uh, and make note of them. One is regulatory assets under management. And we just wanted to stress, because we've been getting the, the uh, questions, uh, we continue to get questions about how to calculate RAUM, uh, <clears throat> you, you know, what is the SEC looking for, and it's a very mechanical type of formula, and you need to uh, uh, go to the uh, item 5F of the ADV and also related instructions, and you'll see it takes you through a test in terms of number, a two-pronged test. Uh, are you uh, providing advice? Uh, with respect to a securities portfolio, which is a defined term. And then are you giving continuous and regular supervisory or management services with respect to that securities portfolio? And a lot of that is going to fall on whether you have discretion or not. Uh, and, and then there's some further factors. Just given time, we're not going to go into a deep dive of, of RAUM other than to say it's well worth making sure and, again, reviewing your RAUM calculation and also being able to articulate your, uh, uh, you know, the manner in which you calculated it with a view to the SEC exam staff because it is something they, uh, they look at. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bria, to discuss one of the other items we wanted to mention, custody, as, you know, as part of the ADV uh, update season. Yes, thanks, Cliff. So you might recall that the Division of Investment Management issued guidance on inadvertent custody back in 2017, which created some confusion among advisors. Um, in response to that confusion, the division issued a new question to its list of FAQs last June. And the question that is addressed is whether an advisory firm would be required to comply with the custody rule for clients' accounts if the advisor uh, one, is not a party to a custodial agreement between a client and a qualified custodian, and two, does not know whether any of its client's custodial agreements would give its firm inadvertent custody. Um, the division responded with three key points around that, um, and I think that FAQ is worth reading as you make your way through um, the filing of your Form ADB, and I can hand it back to Cliff. Thank 
Yeah, thanks, Bria. As to the next item, senior investors, uh, you, you know, we, we've been getting some questions about what does the SEC staff anticipate or expect to see in ADVs with respect to senior investors? And uh, that topic, we, we, you know, we've been making the point, and we just wanted to make the point here, is not really necessarily playing itself out in ADV disclosures. They might be in, in, in some ADVs, but really not, not uh, you know, certainly across the board. And when the uh, SEC uh, is, is saying that they're going to focus on advisory practices with respect to senior investors, their real focus is on policies and procedures in place at the advisors for dealing with financial exploitation or suspected instances of financial exploitation, training, and the like. And there really hasn't been any uh, disclosure that's emerging or expectation. So we have it on the list. Uh, but, but just to sort of clarify that it's not really playing out as a, a disclosure item as much as something that firms should have, you know, robust policies and procedures uh, regarding as, as well as uh, training and the like. And just, uh, just to keep it going back and forth, Bri, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk on uh, advisory fees. Thanks, Cliff. So during last year's webcast, we reviewed OC's risk alert addressing the most frequent advisory fee and expense compliance issues identified in SEC deficiency letters. Um, in the interest of time, we would like to just highlight a few questions that advisors should review um, giving the, the filing of Form ADV um, at the end of this month. So um, whether or not your fees are being billed on a basis that's consistent with what is disclosed in your Form ADV, are you prorating fees um, for advisory services that begin mid-billing cycle? Are you reimbursing fees for fees paid in advance when advisory services are terminated mid-billing cycle? Um, are you aggregating client, uh, client account values for fee billing purposes and reducing a client's fee rate when they reach um, certain breakpoint levels? Um, and just overall, are your disclosures um, otherwise consistent with your actual practices? Um, so I'll pass it back to Cliff again. Great. Thanks. So I'll, I'll take the next two items, and then we'll uh, uh, mention quickly a couple of mechanical filing issues, again, as, as you know, with, a, with an eye towards the March 31st uh, filing uh, deadline. So with respect to share classes, it's really just to make the obvious point that share recommendations with respect to share classes and uh, whether or not the advisor is recommending anything other than the lowest share class is such a... Uh, a uh, high priority for the SEC, and again, it's just, just for the sake of completeness, we have it on this list, uh, but it's something that firms should really be spending a lot of attention to, the type of disclosure, what they're saying, and the like, and uh, in a couple of minutes after we finish the uh, ADV update, Issa Han is going to talk on the whole share class initiative, and, and the disclosure issue will come through uh, a bit in that discussion as uh, well. Uh, and the last thing is state fiduciary legislation and regulations. Uh, as, as during this hour, uh, Ben Marzouk is going to talk about some of the state fiduciary regulations uh, and, and also legislative developments that would impose a fiduciary duty on broker-dealers and also crystallize a fiduciary duty with respect to advisors. So some of the questions we've been getting is what disclosure, what do we have to say uh, in our ADV about the Nevada fiduciary, uh, fiduciary regulation? And we're really not... Uh, uh, seeing any, any any need for any particular disclosure, and we're not seeing any SEC indication of you know they're, they're expecting disclosure. So again, sort of like the senior investor point, we, we have it there uh, this time with a question mark, just to say it's really not playing out as a disclosure item that we're seeing as part of the 2019 ADV update. With that, Bria, could uh, we'll go to the next slide, and if you could take the uh, the me uh, mechanical filing issues. Sure, thanks, Cliff. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to note for um, in getting ready for filing this, this month is that March 31st falls on a Sunday this year. Um, and while the IARD system is typically available Monday through Friday from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time, the call center itself is only available Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. So it's not available on Saturdays and Sundays, so we would recommend um, completing your filing by the Friday before, Friday, March 29th, so that you're able to iron out any details, any questions that you might have or any issues that you might have filing. Um, the second 
thing that we'd remind you to do is to check your IAR, IARD fund, um, your account funds, to make sure that you don't need to submit any additional funds, or if you do need to submit additional funds, that you do that at least several days before you plan to file. Um, you won't be able to submit your filing until the funds are received and credited to your IARD account, so you just want to make sure that your funds are available in there. Um, third, we'd recommend that you do a run-through um, so you can man manually run a completeness check, completeness check um, prior to submitting your filing to check for any, um, any completeness of required fields. So the completeness check will highlight the, um, any errors, any required fields that have not been completed, and you'll be able to um, click on a link to get to those errors and remedy those before your filing is complete. Um, the completeness check will also highlight um, if you have any filing fees that are due that are not covered by your fund, um, by your, uh, fund account balance. So um, the completeness check will help you to kind of narrow down on issues before you get to that final filing submission. Um, last point here is that Part 2A uh, text has to be searchable. It has to be text searchable. Um, a PDF file that you upload into the IARD system. The IARD system will not allow you to upload a PDF if it is not text searchable, so you'll just want to keep that in mind. And now I'll pass it back to Cliff. Thanks, uh, thanks, Bria. So, uh, so a few quick points we wanted to mention on the ADV uh, update season. Now we'll pivot and, and talk about the SEC share class selection disclosure initiatives. As we noted, we do these web webcasts quarterly, and this is something we've been uh, following. And most recently, there's been uh, uh, the, the large settlement that's been announced by the SEC. East is going to walk us through that. Great. Thanks so much, Cliff, and thank you, everyone, for joining us again today. We really appreciate it. So we wanted to provide a brief update on the share class selection disclosure initiative uh, because there was a pretty significant uh, event that took place last week, or I guess within the last couple of weeks. On March 11th, uh, you know, or just about a, you know, a week or a week and a half ago, the SEC announced the first wave of settlements that it had come to with a number of firms, 79 in total, who had elected to participate in the share class selection disclosure initiative. So that's a, a, a pretty significant uh, update of, of, you know, uh, with, you know, with respect to that initiative. If, um, if, if any of you are not familiar with, with, the, with the nature of the initiative generally, just some background on it. It arose out of uh, a, a series of enforcement actions that took place probably in the two, starting in the 2015-2016 timeframe uh, where the SEC found that a number of firms had failed to provide full and fair disclosure regarding their share class selection uh, uh, procedures. So the, really the, the crux of the issue is that a number of investment advisors have affiliated broker dealers or are themselves dual registrants and they recommend uh, mutual funds uh, or share classes of mutual funds that pay 12B1 fees to either the, um, the dual registrant itself or its affiliated broker dealer. And what the SEC staff was saying in a number of these enforcement actions dating back to the 2015-2016 timeframe was hey, you, you had a conflicted compensation arrangement and you didn't provide full and fair disclosure on it. So in that period, the SEC, uh, the SEC uh, you know, sanctioned those firms. And after a while of the SEC continuously finding this issue, they decided to come up with a share class selection disclosure initiative so that firms could come forward on their own, self-report the issue, agree to favorable settlement terms that really only involved a censure, Disgorgement of the you know the, the funds that they re they they received associated with these uh, mutual fund share classes and they could just move on. You know the the firms that have elected to participate um, so far it's it's been 79 that have that have come forward. Uh, it, based on the press release that the SEC came out with last week, it seems like there's um, some more to come. There's going to be subsequent firms that are going to be announced as having participated in the initiative. Uh, and, you know, just kind of looking at the, the settlements that came out, there are really no surprises here. This is about the number of firms that we expected to participate. The terms uh, that the SEC staff or the SEC laid out in the, in the settlements are about what we expected in terms of, uh, you know, the, the nature of them. They basically did what they promised to do. 
in terms of the, the favorable settlement terms that they that they said they'd be offering. And uh, I think it's it's safe to say that um, you know based on previous uh, communications from from the SEC that if you didn't participate in the share class initiative, you're not going to be getting terms that are as favorable as those that are announced as part of this initiative. And moving on to the next slide here, just to kind of address some takeaways and unanswered questions from the initiative. And, you know, what can you do if, uh, if basically if you didn't participate in this initiative? What can you do right now to, uh, you know, to kind of get yourself in a position where you, you minimize or you mitigate your, your, your risk exposure uh, with respect to share class issues? The first thing that you can do, in my opinion, is you can take a look at the 2016 uh, or July 2016 uh, share class initiative risk alert that the SEC staff put out, as well as you know the other uh, press releases and settlements that came out as part of this initiative, and consider ways in which your disclosures and your policies and procedures can be enhanced to deal with uh, this this conflict. One one thing that you can also take a look at. Uh, so that the, the, the firms that participated in this initiative, the, the names or the identities of those firms are public. And all those firms, as part of the settlement that they agreed to, agreed to enhance their own disclosures around uh, share class selection issues. So you can expect that all those firms are going to be making changes to their disclosures that they think are going to be responsive to the SEC's concerns around share class uh, issues. So as you know, a firm maybe that didn't participate in the initiative, you can leverage what those other firms did in terms of their disclosures to get and, and uh, take a look at those you know, disclosures and improve your own disclosures based on what some of those other firms did um, and, and in the hopes that you know, your, your, the strengthening of that disclosure might mitigate some of the, the issues that you, you could have with the SEC going forward. Um, some unanswered questions. With respect to the share class initiative, a logical next step for the SEC is for them to start questioning conflicted compensation arrangements for fees that don't involve 12B1 fees, things like sub-TAs, administrative fees, et cetera. So there, that's kind of another shoe that's yet to drop. And if you do receive those, those fees, you be, would be very well served to take a look at your policies and procedures and your disclosures around those, those fees uh, to get those in shape um, in case the SEC staff comes in and starts, you know, kicking the tires on, on those issues in the future. Uh, another thing, um, you know, that's kind of an unanswered question out of the initiative is, what if you fail to put your clients in the lowest cost available share class, but neither you nor any of your affiliates receive 12B1 fees? As I mentioned earlier, a key component of this, this issue that the SEC staff has identified is that the dual registrants or an affiliated broker-dealer has been receiving the 12B1 fee is at issue. If you're an investment advisor um, that's not also registered as a broker-dealer or you don't have an affiliated broker-dealer or you just haven't been receiving any of these 12B1 fees at all, you know, how, what, what should you be doing? Do you have anything to worry about? I think there is potentially something to worry about. If you take a look at the 2016 risk alert that I mentioned, as well as some of the prior enforcement actions, one thing that the SEC staff, one line of argument that the SEC staff has made is that if you fail to put your clients in the lowest cost available share class, that's potentially a best execution failure. That, you know, and that is, has nothing to do with the 12B1 fees. That has to just do with, um, or that, that doesn't have to do with the 12B1 fees that you receive. It just has to do with the cost of the, of the share class that you're putting somebody in. Uh, maybe it involves a higher expense ratio than something that is otherwise available. And the SEC staff has advanced that line of argument in the past relating to best execution. So one thing that you may want to you know, take a look at is whether um, you are fully meeting your best execution obligations when you, um, you know, when you select a particular share class for a client. So those are the, the takeaways that I had on this, and uh, I want to turn it over back to Cliff. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. So as part of these uh, webcasts, these quarterly updates, we, we – try to also reinforce some of the uh, developments that come through by way of uh, risk alerts. And uh, what, one of the risk alerts since our last one was an OC risk alert on electronic communications. And just as a general matter, we're seeing more by way of OC in terms of 
uh, guidance, risk alert. So again, we try to follow uh, follow that through these webcasts, and Bria is going to walk us through that. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Bria. Thank you, Cliff. So in December of last year, OC issued a risk alert reminding advisors to review their risks, practices, policies, and procedures regarding electronic messaging. Um, and they also advised them to consider improvements to their compliance programs. Um, the risk alert notes that OC observed a range of practices, and the staff identified examples of practices that advisors um, could, um, could adopt in meeting their obligations under the Advisors Act. Um, so before we review the examples, it's important to note what OC considered to be in, within the scope of electronic messaging for purposes of this risk alert, essentially like a who, what, where, and how. Um, so who, um, who did they consider? Um, they looked at firm personnel, including employees, IARs, independent contractors. Um, for the what, they really looked at written business communications conveyed electronically. So anything that related to the advisory business that was um, sent electronically. Um, it was you know, text messages or SMS messaging, instant messaging, personal email, um, personal or private messaging. And then the where, um, they looked at the information contained on advisor systems, computers, and mobile devices, but also third-party applications or platforms, um, but also personally owned computers or mobile devices that are used for advisory business by personnel. Um, but it did exclude because the, uh, the um, OC felt comfortable that, that firm emails were pretty much um, one of those areas that advisors were used to um, complying with um, record keeping and compliance rules for. So it excluded emails um, on an advisor system. So um, on the next slide, pro we provide a list of the examples of practices that OC um, believes based on its observations um, that advisors could consider adopting to meet their obligations under the Advisors Act. So I'll highlight a few here without going through the exhaustive, exhaustive list, but you'll see the second bullet point here, um, policies that specifically prohibit the use of apps and other technologies that can be misused. So those that allow anonymous communications or automatic destruction of messages or that are incapable of third party viewing or backup. Um, also procedures including specific instructions for moving incoming communications to an electronic system that has been approved by the advisor. So for example, if an advisor receives a message from a client on a social media site that's prohibited by the firm for business purposes, there should be some procedure in place for moving that communication to a system that has been approved for record keeping purposes. Um, and the last bullet point here, um, soliciting feedback so that you understand uh, from personnel what forms of messaging have been requested by clients and service providers so that you can identify areas that may be at risk or the areas that you may want to think about um, providing controls around. On the next slide, um, we continue with these examples of practices based on OC's observation. So a supervisory review um, is one thing that I, OC highlighted in this risk alert. For permitted uses of electronic messaging, OC noted that um, contracting with software vendors to perform supervisory reviews of social media posts, emails, websites, archiving those communications and making sure that they have the capability to identify changes to content and compare the postings to a lexicon of keywords and phrases to identify things that may not be um, within the guidelines that the firm has created for um, these communications. Also, we'll highlight on this slide, um, conducting regular searches or creating automatic, um, automated alerts to identify the use of an employer's or an advisor's name to identify potentially unauthorized advisory business being conducted online. And the final one that I'll highlight on this slide is requiring security applications or other software prior to allowing them to be used for business purposes. So really um, emphasizing the security of um, the security and control over devices to make sure that the information that advisors um, and their personnel receive from clients is protected and that information is not um, subject to, to um, any type of hacking or abuse. Now I'll hand it back to Cliff. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Bria. So we're working our way through the uh, topics, and our next topic is update on fiduciary duty initiatives. And before we uh, do that, just one housekeeping, and it's for those who are interested in receiving CLE credit for today's webcast. Our confirmation code is fiduciary. So a perfect lead-in, Ben, to your topic, fiduciary, again, is the confirmation code. So for folks who are getting CLE credit, if you could please use that code for the sign-in sheet available for download from your viewing of console. And with that, Ben, could you walk us through some of the more recent developments relating to uh, the fiduciary duty? Yeah, thank, thanks, Cliff. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to cover uh, both the recent developments on the federal front with the SEC and then also some of the uh, uh, more recent state developments, too. And I know we've covered, uh, you know, the SEC's fiduciary rule um, prior webcast, so, you know, many of us are, are familiar with, you know, what it does and, and how it's achieved. Um, but, uh, it, you know, almost a year ago, uh, it, was a, it was a four to one vote uh, at the commission that the SEC proposed to issue the, uh, the, their sort of standard of conduct rules, which were done in three separate parts. Um, so that, that right there, I mean, the vote itself, uh, that may be, you know, an area of update just to mention since we last probably spoke about this since uh, we did. It was, it was a four to one vote and the makeup of the commission has changed since it was voted upon just to, to propose it uh, almost a year ago. Uh, Kara Stein is no longer on the commission uh, and she has not been replaced, so there's only four commissioners right now, um, and that is a Democratic seat. She was originally a vote, uh, a she was the one vote opposing the actual proposal of the regulation best interest and its accompanying uh, rules as well. Um, and then also Michael P.O.R. has left the commission and was replaced by Eli Roisman, who has been uh, relatively tight-lipped about his views on uh, how he would ultimately vote on whether uh, he would approve the rule or not. Um, so it will be interesting to see, you know, once they do eventually have a full commission, uh, how the how the votes will uh, shift. Uh, you know, two of the two of the uh, five commissioners, when it was proposed, uh, expressed uh, some reservations with the rule, and that was, uh, you know, Commissioner Jackson and Commissioner Purse. And since then, I'd say just in the last uh, few weeks, uh, there have been public statements by both of them. Purse sort of moving towards uh, a more favorable rule a view of the rule and Commissioner Jackson uh, moving in the opposite direction. So they seem to be entrenching in their respective camps. But that will be interesting to see how that plays out uh, when and if the rule is uh, ultimately adopted. Um, j just at a high level, what it does, I mean, we've talked about this before. It is three separate uh, parts. There's the regulation best interest, which applies to broker-dealers um, only. Um, but this would also cover you know, a dual-hatted dual person that is operating in its broker-dealer capacity. There's also a new, you know, a, a, a new disclosure um, that that would apply to uh, sort of as a summary of the relationship for both broker dealers and investment advisors at the outset of the relationship with the retail investor. That's commonly been known as Form CRS. Uh, then there's, you know, within uh, uh, Form CRS, there's also a titling restriction. So brokers would not be able to use advisor or advisor, uh, both with an E and an O when referring to themselves, so they can no longer call themselves financial advisor or wealth advisor, um, and that, that would apply to broker-dealers only. And then finally, there's a, you know, a restatement of the existing fiduciary duty that applies to investment advisors, kind of crystallizing the guidance, which before the rule had kind of been uh, cobbled together through you know, a series of releases and uh, different uh, informal SEC guidance issued over the years. Uh, so it was, there was a 90-day comment period that had already closed, and we, I think, on a previous webcast had uh, discussed the comments sort of and how they were grouped into, you know, pro-industry, pro pro-consumer, and then, you know, uh, you know, everything kind of broke down in those respective buckets. But thousands of comment letters received by the SEC on the rule proposal. Um, the, sort of the million-dollar question is what exactly does best interest mean? Um, if we, you know, yeah, so, and uh, the best interest is kind of, I think the SEC felt a lot of criticism over what exactly was meant by best interest because they really didn't adequately define it, uh, many commentators from the industry felt. All they said was that the recommendation must not place the interest of the broker-dealer ahead of the retail customer, uh, which really doesn't mean much. Um, so what, what they did do, however, was create a safe harbor of sorts, um, and they said that uh, if you meet these three standards, we would have deemed uh, you to, to have met the best interest standard. And those, those three standards are the disclosure standard, the care standard, and the conflict of interest. 
Um, disclosure, you know, pretty straightforward, disclosing all material conflicts of interest. Care is more or less, a, a, you know, restatement of the existing suitability uh, obligations for a broker dealer. And then the third one is creating a bit of, uh, you know, that's I think where most of the industry is, is concerned is how exactly your broker dealer must uh, mitigate or possibly even eliminate the conflicts of interest. Uh, because in order to meet the safe harbor, uh, you've got to maintain policies and procedures that uh, disclose uh, and and also mitigate or eliminate uh, the conflict of interest. And that's kind of the key question. So if we move forward to the to the issues that seem to be kind of surrounding this proposal, that that's I think at the top of the list. What what conflicts are those conflicts that you can disclose and mitigate and manage properly in your compliance system versus the conflicts that can no longer be mitigated and you can't manage and just need to be eliminated entirely. And the things that have been flashpoints for the industry are usually compensated, compensation related, uh, different compensation grids or sales contexts or prizes or non-cash comp awards. So these things might have to be, you know, I think clarified by, by the SEC in terms of how they would treat them uh, under a final rule proposal and, and specifically what types of conflicts can be mitigated versus uh, need to be eliminated entirely. Uh, how reasonable compensation would be uh, mitigated would, is another sort of uh, main issue, the duties owed to the customer, uh, what exactly is meant by the best interest standard, the enforceability of the, of the regulation. Uh, unlike the Department of Labor's rule a few years prior, there is not necessarily an explicit private right of action like there would be in, in Labor's you know, uh, best interest contract. Um, and, and, that, uh, and that seems to be an issue from an enforceability standpoint. And then finally, we're, we'll move next to uh, state laws that, and how state laws would mesh with the SEC's regulation because there have been um, some very recent developments on the state law front that would be worth discussing, um, especially here in the last quarter since we last spoke about it. Um, so in, in 2017, Nevada amended its financial planner statute to effectively impose a fiduciary duty on both brokers, broker dealers and investment advisors, and they, they did this by removing an existing exemption for BDs and IAs. So but before the amendment, any person meeting the state's definition of a financial planner was subject to an explicit fiduciary duty. But there was an uh, exception for broker dealers and investment advisors. So the 2017 amendments, which took effect on July 1st, 2017, removed that exemption and therefore effectively imposed a fiduciary duty on, on these broker dealers or advisors because they otherwise would, would meet the definition of a financial planner in Nevada. And after these rules took effect, uh, Nevada held a few public hearings to solicit comments on the amendments. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they understood that this was creating, you know, quite a bit of industry pushback and maybe quite didn't understand how their rule would fit within the SEC's competing regulation uh, and competing framework and, and even FINRA's competing suitability framework. Uh, so they received public comments during these hearings held informal meetings with industry and market participants, and then, and then issued implementing regulations uh, just, you know, this, this, this year, January 18th, 2019. And, you know, we don't necessarily have time to highlight everything that these regulations did, Nevada's implementing regulations, but, you know, some, some takeaways are important to focus on. Uh, first, Nevada, Nevada's fiduciary duty would apply to broker-dealers during the time period for which they're engaged in certain uh, specifically enumerated activities in the regulation, including providing investment advice, performing discretionary training, uh, maintaining assets under management, acting in a fiduciary capacity toward the client, disclosing fees or gains, uh, uh, completing a contract with the customer, and, and also through any other term of engagement of services that they set. Uh, so, you know, it is listed to specific activities, which, you know, are, are fairly broad and would cover a lot of the activities uh, you know, that, that, are, that broker dealers and advisors would engage in. Second, uh, Nevada's proposing regulations would impose uh, an ongoing fiduciary duty on a broker dealer unless the broker dealer satisfied uh, the condition of what they call an episodic exemption for providing isolated investment advice. So, so this means that if you're providing one-time investment advice, uh, the fiduciary duty ends once the advice provide, is provided and the transaction is complete. So you could, you know, as a broker, just hold yourself out as a one-time transaction-based individual and, uh, you know, presumably uh, be able to rely on this episodic exemption where you'd only be subject to that fiduciary duty just for the limited time period in which you're providing the advice and executing the transaction.
And then finally, uh, the comment period for these proposed regulations uh, it was fairly short. It already closed. It was on March 1st to closed. Uh, but the, you know, as we understand that, you know, the Nevada is sort of working through the, the multiple industry letters on this point and, uh, you know, we'll be moving forward as they, uh, as they see fit. Uh, I also wanted to highlight uh, Maryland. Uh, there's a few other states up there, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York as well. Uh, ma many of those states are disclosure-only uh, uh, fiduciary duties where if you're holding yourself out as someone other than a fiduciary, you need to disclose to the customer at the outset of the customer relationship that you're not a fiduciary. Uh, Maryland is different in that it is an explicit fiduciary duty. Um, and this, 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 this was initially proposed and then withdrawn in 2018 but eventually reproposed in 2019 um, and just introduced, uh, you know, in February of this last of this year in the Maryland General Assembly, and it includes amendments to the Maryland Securities Act to an ex to uh, to impose an explicit fiduciary standard, um, requiring them to act in the best interest of their customer w without regard to the financial interests of the firm or the uh, rep. Um, so important to note that there's no at least. It authorizes the Maryland Securities Department and securities regulators to issue implementing regulations, but the actual uh, bill as proposed does not include any exceptions like Nevada did from the, uh, or at least Nevada's regulations did from this fiduciary duty. Um, so then uh, I guess I guess really quick, uh, finally, I'd, I'd mentioned this MIA preemption point. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, there's not a lot of clarity as to how NISMIA, uh, if, if at all, would preempt these state laws, assuming the SEC's rule was adopted, but this seems to be uh, a point that I think the industry uh, would, you know, is going to want some uh, more clarity from the SEC uh, and the state regulators on how exactly the, the different layers of uh, regulation would operate together, uh, particularly given that NISMIA does allow for preemption of certain specified laws when they differ from uh, competing federal standards. Um, and then, and then, really quick, uh, finally, on just sort of the, where we are on the road ahead. I mean, the the uh, you know both uh, the House and the Senate, the uh, Congress is calling for hearings to discuss uh, this regulation. Uh, so there seems to be getting a good amount of uh, support uh, amongst uh, uh, politicians to you know take an interest in this and really make sure that it is pr uh, protecting investors and clarifying the distinction between what a broker does and what an advisor does. Uh, the comment period has already expired, like I mentioned, to the SEC's rule, and at least uh, on the SEC's semi-annual regulatory agenda, it's listed as expected to be finalized by September of this year, uh, although it may come as soon as, as this summer. Um, and then finally, the legal challenges, like I mentioned earlier, uh, may take place under NISMIA. So uh, with, with that, I'll, I'll kind of hand it back over to Cliff. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so we're going to sort of turn from the fiduciary developments uh, to talk about uh, a, a couple of issues that are that are brewing within the division of investment management. Uh, so when, when we went to print with this, it was you know, we wanted to focus on custodial practices, but beyond custodial practices, there have been other important uh, points that investment management has made about things they're looking at or things that could be expected with respect to proxy advisors and the advertising rules. So Michael's going to take us through that. Sure. Um, so a couple of recent developments, as Cliff mentioned. Um, first, I'll start with the advertising rule. <clears throat> this has uh, appeared on the um, long-term agenda and then the short-term agenda a few months ago. Just a quick update on that. Dahlia Blass, the Director of Investment Management, spoke at the Investment Advisor Association Conference uh, on Friday, this past Friday, and said um, – Staff is working on it, and it uh, should be out for proposal in the very near future. She reiterated um, statements that have been made previously that we're talking about a comprehensive update. We're not talking about a tinkering. We're talking about uh, potentially a, 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 something that looks very different than what the, the rule looks like today, uh, including incorporating within the text of the rule, you know, 45 plus years of no action letters and interpretive guidance in various uh, contexts actually appear in the rule and also being updated to reflect how we how we and advisors um, communicate at large uh, via social media, via email texting, uh, SMS, etc. Uh, and then just changes in society in terms of the use of testimonials. So the rule is going it's, to, it's really going to be a wholesale revamp of the entire rule which hasn't really been amended in any significant degree since the 1960s. So long overdue and something that should appear on everyone's radar screen very soon. The second thing is uh, proxy advisor guidance. 
Um, just to recap uh, very briefly, uh, Chairman Clayton kind of tapped Commissioner Alad Reisman uh, to take the lead on, uh, on this issue. And um, Commissioner Reisman, in his first public statement um, yesterday, said he, uh, he really is going to be focusing on, with respect to investment advisors, how advisors use voting guidelines that are created by the proxy advisory firms and how um, they utilize this in casting their votes. Uh, second thing he emphasized is re he's really concerned, as, um, as everyone is at the commission, with respect to proxy advisor conflicts of interest. You might uh, recall that the proxy rule is an anti-fraud rule, and the reason why it's an anti-fraud rule is, is in large measure is, is to address the conflicts that advisors have in voting proxies and um, uh, in, in no action letters that have been issued, which have then been uh, basically taken back by the staff. Um, the concern is really about uh, conflicts and, and, and what the staff and now the commission is saying, it's not just about the advisor's conflicts. Uh, we don't want you just to trade your conflicts for the conflicts of the proxy advisors. Uh, so there's going to be a heavy emphasis on, on the conflicts that the proxy advisors have. He did mention at the end of his speech that he does not believe we should impose additional regulations upon the proxy advisor firms without thorough consider consideration. Um, so he, what that was basically taken as a message, we're gonna, you know, the commission is going to move very slow, not, maybe not slowly, but very carefully in imposing any additional regulatory regime on proxy advisors. Um, Dahlia Blast, um, who I just mentioned with respect to the advertising rule, also spoke yesterday and made similar comments saying that uh, there's, the SEC is eyeing guidance for investment managers around the end of the proxy season in the coming months. Um, and again, she emphasized the agency is focusing on how advisors use the proxy voting guidance from uh, proxy advisory firms to make sure that they cast votes in the best interest of clients and how they address conflicts of interest. So it's possible that uh, in the next few months we'll have an advertising proposed advertising rule and guidance uh, for advisors when um, casting proxies. So two, two things to be on the lookout for in the next few months. Now turning to um, another thing, uh, recent development, on March 12th, um, the staff uh, sent um, a letter to the Investment Advisor Association uh, discussing an issue that's been the source of agitation for some time. Uh, you might recall that in uh, 2017, um, the staff issued guidance update 2017-1, which introduced for the first time the concept of in inadvertent custody, uh, where an advisor might be deemed to have custody because of a provision in the, an agreement the client has with a third-party custodian, something that the advisor never even sees or p potentially doesn't even know about. Um, and that, for obvious reasons, raised um, concerns uh, on the part of the uh, advisory industry. and. There have been a lot of questions lobbed at the commission staff following that, that, that guidance update and just lots of uncertainty in the industry um, regarding that, you know, that guidance update. And also, uh, a second thing um, where the staff has been getting bombarded with questions are uh, non-DVP custodial practices. So in the adopting release from that 2009 when the custody rule was amended, um, um, the, the commission said, you know, it's not custody when an advisor is authorized to give instruction to a custodian or broker-dealer as to how to affect a trade. So those instructions are not custody. However, that so-called authorized trading exception is limited to DVP arrangements, delivery versus payment arrangements, uh, where the advisor is basically transferring securities or client funds to the custodial account that's maintained by the custodian. So that caused a lot of advisors that don't trade uh, exclusively uh, through DVP arrangements to ask a lot of questions from the staff. The staff has heard those questions, and one of its response is this letter that was sent to the IEA on March 12th, in which the staff unlike all of their prior writings on this subject, did not answer questions or provide guidance, instead it asked a lot of questions, saying we need to understand more and we need to understand better non-DVP trading practices to make sure that any guidance we give is appropriate. 
So they asked all sorts of questions in the letter regarding non-DVP training practices, what instruments use them, what are the risks of misappropriation for the, such trading practices, what independent checks exist, are there particular types of transactions that trade on a non-DVP basis that present greater risk, what role do custodians play, do custodians mitigate the risk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the staff is basically showing, telling the industry we want answers to these questions and then we'll take appropriate steps to, to address this, quote, gap, if you will, that appears for non-DVP custodial arrangements. And the takeaway really is the staff and the commission in the rule itself is basically treating non-DVP uh, arrangements differently than DVP arrangements because of the inherent increased risk that the commission um, sees in non-DVP arrangements. And finally, it did, with respect to non-DVP arrangements, point um, to the adopting release to the 2009 amendments and the company uh, interpretive release to say, hey, advisors, you probably should look at these, of uh, the guidance in these um, these releases for uh, as to how to lower your risk for misappropriation for non-DVP arrangements. The second part of the um, letter to the IA uh, on March 12th deals with digital assets. Um, for obvious reasons, there have been a lot of questions thrown at the staff in the last year or so um, about uh, distributed ledger technology, blockchain, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, you've had a lot of guidance uh, issued by the uh, the staff and the commission on all sorts of things relating to digital assets. Are they securities? When are they securities? Um, Etc. But this particular letter focuses on the cu custody aspects of digital assets for investment advisors under 2062, the custody rule under the Advisors Act. And <clears throat> the staff notes that there are certain characteristics with digital assets that create challenges for advisors to comply with the custody rule. And you see them listed on the page. And it, similar to its focus in, in, in practice with respect to non-DVP um, DVP custodial practices, the staff then asks all sorts of questions with respect to uh, digital assets and the custody of digital assets. Um, what challenges do they present for advisors to comply with the custody rule? How should concerns about misappropriation of digital assets be addressed? If there's a loss um, due to misappropriation of digital assets, how should they be remedied? What's the settlement process look like with peer-to-peer -peer digital assets, and also when it's not peer-to-peer -peer, but it's through some sort of trading uh, medium? And interestingly, the final question I'll just mention before we move on is, the staff asks, what's the role for distributed ledger, to, to, distributed ledger technology with respect to digital assets, but also potentially with respect to non-digital assets, which I, which I thought was an interesting question to ask. So again, the staff is going to do the same thing with respect to non-DVP issues. It's going to take the information it gathers from, um, from, from the industry in response to these questions and then figure out, okay, what's... You know, how do we proceed? I would expect there to be guidance, maybe in another guidance update, um, maybe potentially uh, potential rulemaking, um, uh, which the staff alluded to at the IA conference uh, last week. Uh, it's, it's possible that you can see the rule actually be amended to deal with uh, both non-DVP trading and with respect to digital assets. Great. Cliff? Great. Thanks, Michael. And uh, just to... Uh, take our final two topics, we wanted to mention and, and discuss a couple of things uh, of interest to European-based advisors. The first is uh, GDPR and related developments regarding SEC uh, registration of uh, European-based advisors, and John Walsh was going to cover that, so we'll turn it over to you, John, for that discussion. Great. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about GDPR and European advisors, as Cliff had said. Uh, there are some recent developments here that are having a big impact on European advisors, particularly those who would like to register with the SEC, but so far have not done so. And the, the bottom line is, and we'll come back to this, uh, new registrations are uh, on hold. Uh, the SEC is not uh, uh, recognizing new reg registrations from Europe. Um, but uh, before we get to the bottom line, let's uh, take a look at the context for this. Uh, and the starting point is to recognize uh, that it's really not just a European issue. Uh, it seems to be presenting first with Europe, uh, but we should not assume it's going to end there. And, and the, the starting point 
if you look at your form ADV uh, at the back, there is a signature area for non-resident investment advisors, foreign advisors. And by signing the form, you agree to provide the SEC with correct, current, and complete copies of any required records. Uh, and those records include a lot of information about your clients. In signing, you also certify that the records will be available for inspection. And the SEC takes the view that all records that an advisor has at the time of an examination are subject to inspection. And, and that creates an even larger uh, set of records that could be relevant uh, to your clients. Well, the question that everyone is beginning to wrestle with is, well, what if you're subject to a foreign privacy regime that interferes with your ability to send such information to the SEC? And we're going to talk mostly about GDPR, but it's important to recognize it's not limited to GDPR. Uh, several significant societies, economies around the world uh, have been upgrading their privacy regulation. For example, South Korea. Uh, South Korea is under constant cyber attack from its neighbors to the north and uh, has uh, enacted a privacy regime that is the most stringent in the world, including hefty personal liability uh, for people and entities that suffer breaches. Japan has been focusing on uh, its privacy regime and was recently recognized by the Europeans uh, for uh, how much they have focused on this and, and upgraded their privacy controls. But for the rest of uh, our discussion today, we're going to talk about the European Union. But it's important to recognize why the European Union uh, is active here. And it's because a, a person by the name of Snowden, who was an NSA analyst, defected to Russia and whatever you think about Mr. Snowden, in doing so, he revealed the level of U.S. surveillance, and it shocked the Europeans. Um, they viewed uh, this level of surveillance as potentially a, a human rights issue, and they're very skeptical about U.S. privacy controls. And, and that's the fundamental context that we're in today. And the next slide, please. That led to what's called the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. And GDPR is a comprehensive privacy regime. We're really not going to talk about it here today. Um, it defines personal data very broadly. It covers anyone who has a presence in the US, EU or processes data about the EU. But our, our uh, focus today is how it's having an impact on the SEC examination program and registration with the SEC. Now, if you look at GDPR, and in particular at Article 45, you will see that a transfer of data to a third country may take place only when the EU has decided the third country ensures, quote, an adequate level of protection and a handful of countries have been approved as providing an adequate level of protection. For example, Japan uh, has, was recently approved in this regard. There has been no blanket approval for the U.S. And given the skepticism that Europe felt about U.S. Uh, privacy controls that led to GDPR, perhaps this is not surprising. According to press reports, U.S. regulators asked, uh, they reached out to Europe to try and get this approval and, and were not successful. So the U.S., at least according to GDPR, is outside the ballywick, which means that uh, transfers of data uh, can't take place to the U.S., which includes the SEC. Uh, how can the SEC oversee advisors located in Europe if they can't look at information relating uh, to the advisor's clients. Now, as an example of how this area is relatively fast moving, IOSCO, which is the International Organization of Securities Commissions, recently obtained just a few weeks ago an administrative agreement uh, from the EU saying that sharing among regulators pursuant to the IOSCO multilateral memorandum of understanding may go forward. Uh, that is, in fact, a permissible transfer.
So regulators will be able to talk with each other. Uh, that doesn't really help the SEC, though, in regards to its desire to be able to get information directly from advisors that are registered with it. Well, where are we then? Well, frankly, we're, we're kind of back to the pre-Unibanco days where conflicts between U.S. regulation and foreign regulations are interfering with the ability to extend uh, a seamless and open uh, regulatory regime across borders. New SEC registrations of EU domiciled advisors are on hold. One must wonder if this is going to spread as uh, GDPR-type regulation spreads around the world. And apparently in, in the registration process, the SEC is asking, can you produce an opinion of counsel that you can comply with the signature certifications for non-resident advisors? And uh, not surprisingly, given GDPR 45, Article 45, and the problems people are facing, uh, that's a very hard opinion to sign. And my understanding is um, uh, people are not willing to do so. So going forward, uh, what's going to happen to EU domiciled advisors who are subject to GDPR who are already registered with the SEC? Um, it would seem that the same issues that apply to the advisors who are trying to get registered would apply to those who are already registered. And I think we're all sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. We don't know when or how that will come, but uh, it might and then also, of course, moving forward, what about all the other jurisdictions that are adopting GDPR-like systems? The, the bottom line here, uh, I think this is becoming a, a fairly significant issue. Uh, it's probably going to require government-to-government -government resolution between the United States government and the European government and those other countries that are taking a, a, an approach to privacy along the lines of GDPR. But right now, if you're in Europe, and you want to register with the SEC, it looks like you're out of luck. Uh, and Cliff, back to you. That's it for me. Great, John. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Uh, helpful discussion, so we appreciate that. Uh, we, we know we're at the uh, almost at the top of the hour, but we did want to spend time with uh, one more topic, so thanks for uh, sticking with us for just a couple of minutes more. And we're going to turn it over to uh, Hannah Jones in London just to walk us through some of the uh, hot topics in the U.K., Thanks, Cliff. Uh, so good afternoon from London. Um, and as Cliff mentioned today, I just wanted to give a whistle-stop tour, really, of a couple of things which are keeping us busy in the UK. So apologies if I fly through. Um, and you won't be surprised to hear that one of these is Brexit. Uh, the position obviously isn't final, but I will touch on what we know at the moment a bit later. So firstly, I want to talk about the FCA's Asset Management Market Study. And this is a major review by the FCA stemming from their concerns that investors may not be able to assess whether they are getting value for money, and there may not be enough competition in the asset management sector. And although the report was pretty critical on the industry, it was widely welcomed, and the final rules which were published earlier this year include changes which our clients are having to action now with relatively short implementation periods, and I'll touch on these later. So the slide that we're on at the moment and the next slide, actually, um, I, I've just included these for further background of the various stages and the implementation dates, but what you will be able to see is that the final rules from this review have been long awaited. So if we just move on to the next slide, the, the key points arising out of the study, well, these all go to the theme of stronger investor protection. The FCA found that asset managers were achieving benefits of scale, which were not being passed back on to investors. Investment funds are getting bigger, but prices are staying the same. And in addition, the FCA found that there is no clear correlation between a fund's price and its performance, so should the price be going down, and questions were also raised as to whether third-party costs should be given more scrutiny. The original proposals from the FCA of needing to consider value for money was in fact replaced with a wider obligation with the need to consider overall value. And the FCA set out additional factors that need to be looked at, including the need to consider the range and quality of service, fund performance, as well as the cost of services. And these factors are very similar to what you have in the US at the moment with the Gartenberg standard. There are also changes to board governance and the removal of barriers to moving investors to cheaper classes. But what I wanted to focus on, actually, if we could just change the slide uh, onto the next one, please, is the point on transparency. 
So there is a concern that asset managers do not effectively communicate their investment strategies and their outcomes to investors. The new focus from the FCA is really designed to ensure that information is clear and investors can compare funds and understand how they're managed. What a fund sets out to do and how it does it should be clear to the investor and should be consistent in all documents. Asset managers should not include flexibility where this is not required, and the strategies taken to achieve the objective should be brought to the attention of the investor, including clarifying whether or not a fund is managed actively to prevent the so-called closet tracking funds. And this concern has largely driven the new benchmark changes, which I'll come on to. Consideration of non-financial objectives is also now relevant. For example, any environmental, social and governance strategies should also be disclosed, and all language should be retail friendly. We've also seen the FCA consider investment management agreements in place behind the scenes to ensure that what they say the managers are doing matches what investors are being told. The FCA published its finalised guidance on the content of investment objectives and policies, but this guidance didn't go as far as was hoped. However, there is a lot of work still ongoing in the industry to try and fill some of the gaps. On the next slide, there's a, um, more information here in relation to the benchmark changes that we've seen. Uh, the first is the benchmark regulation which came into force in January 2018, and this places requirements on index providers and administrators, including the need to be listed on a register maintained by the European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA. But it also applies to users, which will include an asset manager when it's used for tracking, the calculation of a performance fee, or to define asset allocation. And if caught, disclosures need to be included in the prospectus, and a robust written plan needs to be in place. The second is the new FCA rules coming from the market study. So there was a real concern that managers are not using benchmarks consistently, or they were being used and not described at all, and in some cases, funds were closet trackers. The changes to the rules include requirements to disclose the type of benchmark being used in the objective and policy of the fund, and disclosures will also need to change in respect to past performance and where internal so-called soft restrictions are based on an index or another benchmark, such as the Investment Association's fund sectors. And other, inv other investor-facing documents will also need to be updated. And the benchmarks have been classified by the SCA as falling into three categories, either a constraint, a target, or a comparator. Managers will need to describe why the benchmark is chosen if it's appropriate, and why it's appropriate. And if there's no benchmark, then investors need to explain how investors can assess the fund's performance. So interestingly, there's no real grandfathering period, and managers will be required to make these benchmark changes this year. 7th of August is the date for existing funds needing to com comply, and the 7th of May this year is for new funds. So moving on to Brexit, on the next slide. Although Parliament voted last week to rule out leaving the EU without a deal, the vote isn't binding and there's still no guarantee that we will get a deal. If we do get a deal, then nothing will change immediately and the transition period will kick in and we will see where we end up on the other side. So today I'm just focusing on the event of a no deal and what this means for a couple of aspects in the investment fund space. A key point in this area is that the passporting of services and funds into the UK from the EEA and also out of the UK to the EEA will cease immediately. From an EEA perspective, this means that certain EEA firms which currently have a passport allowing them to do business in the UK and EEA funds which are marketed in the UK will be unable to do so following exit. However, <coughs> excuse me, the UK is preparing for this and the next slide sets this out in a bit more detail. So the next two slides set out further detail on a temporary permissions regime which is being put into place by the government. And this is to enable some continuity in the event of a no deal. EEA firms and funds already being passported into the UK will need to consider, sorry, will need to register with the FCA by the 28th of March if they want to be part of the TPR. There is only one shot at this registration, so it needs to be right the first time. Following registration, firms and funds can continue to operate in the UK as if they have authorization in the UK but will given a land, be given a landing slot during which they have to get formal UK authorisation. If they fail to get UK authorisation, they will go into a supervised runoff process, meaning they can honour outstanding commitments through a rundown process. Firms that do not enter the TPR will not be able to rewrite and write new business after exit day. For UK funds, passporting into another EEA state will be the subject of local law in that jurisdiction. 
From a US perspective, currently, <coughs> excuse me, US firms, funds sold to professional investors in the UK are subject to the national pl private placement regime. If these funds are already being sold under that regime, then there won't be any change. But there will be a change for new funds and new notifications under that regime, as that regime is changing and the forms that are currently in place will be updated. For US funds which are currently sold to retail investors in the UK, they, they will need to continue to comply with Section 272 of the Financial Services and Markets Act. However, this process will also change as a result of Brexit in respect of new funds and new notifications. So what we also need to consider in the UK is what about those firms that are, don't enter into the TPR or other regimes which are being put in place? The financial services and contracts regime will allow contracts in place on exit day to continue so that any passporting business into the UK doesn't end immediately on exit day, but no new business can be started under this arrangement. The FSCR comes into effect automatically in the UK for all EEA firms, funds and entities that do not have FCA authorisation and do not enter into a temporary permission or recognition regime for the business in the UK. The FSCR also applies to those funds and firms that enter into a temporary permissions regime but subsequently fail to obtain authorisation when their landing slot comes up. And this regime will last for five years from the exit day for non-insurance business and 15 years for insurance business. So just on the final slide, I just wanted to touch on a couple of other points that we're seeing. So as well as the problem that we've got in the UK with the ceasing of passporting, what we're, we're seeing is that investors, in order to try and combat that, have been setting up mirror fund ranges in the EEA to enable them to continue passporting post-exit day. We're also helping clients to repaper to reflect the, the onshoring of EU law and also the um, business restructuring that we're seeing. At a webinar held by the FCA last week, it was noted that they're expecting firms to take reasonable steps to prepare for Brexit. Interestingly, the FCA also noted that clear and timely investor notifications should be considered to explain what is happening, and this is something that we're considering with clients. <coughs> so, sorry, that was a, a bit of a quick review, and I'm suffering with a little bit of a cold, so, so sorry about the coughing. Um, but if, if there's anything that we can assist with from the UK perspective, or if there are any other questions, then, then please do reach out to us. But otherwise, I'll pass back to you, Cliff. Yeah, thanks so much, Hannah, for going through that. Obviously, a lot going on, uh, just a lot going on o overall. So thanks, everyone, for, uh, for sticking with us during this, uh, this webcast. We want to thank you for, uh, for joining us. And as a reminder, if you want CLE credit, please download the CLE sign-in sheet and evaluation form from your viewing console and follow the instructions for submission. And again, the code is fiduciary. And if you have any questions or would like a copy of the slide deck, feel free to uh, email any one of us uh, and we'll, we'll make it available for you. Happy, happy to get that to you. Thanks again, and we'll uh, be back in touch for the uh, second quarter. Thanks. Bye-bye.